My name's Ian Townsend. I'm a, a former fellow here at the John Oxley Library. In fact, um, I'm studying a, a hurricane that hit North Queensland, and this actually does have something to do with folk, in 1899. And there were 60 uh, vessels in Bathurst Bay on Cape York, and they'd all come down from Thursday Island. And um, in the evening, before the cyclone struck, after a big week, um, all the guys, they're all from 26 different nationalities, and they, there's just sudden upwelling of music. Every single boat had, uh, everybody was a musician. So they had, I can't remember them, uh, Jews harps and very, some very basic um, uh, musical equipment. Mm. And uh, there was just this enormous um, cultural experience. It would have been wonderful to tape it um, and to have rec a recording of that period. But I'm assuming all those um, very cultural, uh, all that cultural music is really part of folk music. These are the, how the music's evolved and, and it's a very basic form of music. So they would have used all sorts of things to, to make their music, including their voices, of course. So it's a fascinating topic to me, and I don't really know much about it, although I did research a little bit about that sort of music when I was doing the, when I, uh, was doing the research a year or so ago mm. as part of my um, thesis at uh, the University of Queensland. This is the last night at the John Oxley Library, and being the centenary of the Gallipoli campaign, we've looked a lot at war this year, which fascinates us for some reason, but it's nice really, I think, um, to look at what I think is the opposite of war, and that's art and um, music. So after a year of, of reflecting on the war, it's good to end with something a bit less grim, less destructive, <laughs> a bit more creative, hopefully. Although, <laughs> <laughs> that's true, isn't it? Um, so tonight we're talking about folk music in Brisbane. Um, I remember going to the bush dances back in the 1980s. And, uh, and as I was thinking about this, I realised that I'd been to a lot of folk festivals over the years and heard a lot of mu folk music and done, I'd been to a lot of bush bands over 30 years and living in different parts of Australia, especially in the country, that's what I was often exposed to. So it's a very accessible working class music. We're going to discuss what is folk music shortly. Um, it does seem to be a subculture, although it's a sort of a very popular subculture. So maybe it's a culture. Uh, it's it's uh, outlived punk. It's been around for so long. It's <laughs> probably going to outlive rap um, with a bit of luck. Um, uh, so the st and the State Library of Queensland actually has a huge collection of photographs and posters and recordings and newsletters over there on the tables um, from the very vibrant Brisbane folk music community going back to the 1950s. And, uh, and after this, you can go and have a look on the tables over there at the, um, at the different um, uh, uh, programs. Some of them are very interesting. Um, I noticed that there was a band called, hang on, I did mention, uh, Baldrick and the Cunning Plans. <laughs> oh, <thanks. laughs> Which, yeah. So there's, um, there's a lot of fun to be had, I think. Um, now, our guests uh, tonight are two people who are immersed in folk music and can tell us, or at least me, quite a bit about its history, particularly in Queensland and Brisbane. Sue Whiten's a singer and songwriter. Uh, she's been in a number of bands, The Wayfarers and more recently Unsung Heroes. She grew up in Jibung, legendary part of Brisbane. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rebecca Wright's another singer-songwriter who's very highly regarded. And I know that she did a stint, stint with Cloud Street, and I've uh, had John Thompson uh, from Cloud Street here at a night at the JOL speaking about his music research. Mm. So, you know, you have Rebecca and Sue and John, and there's a real depth of talent um, in folk music. Um, a sort of a depth of uh, intelligence. Um, I, I think what ties <laughs> them all... <laughs> well, there's a, there is a... There's a it's, it draws in a lot of many parts of our culture, doesn't it? It's very interesting politics mm. and many people involved in folk music are very interested in other things. Mm. So there's That's a... It, it's knitting. Uh, yeah, knitting, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, fishing. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, what's, so what is folk music, I guess, is the, the thing that I'm interested in. I think it keeps a lot of people in the folk music community <laughs> occupied talking about this as well. Um, maybe more than any other type of music, it, it's storytelling. I know that most music is storytelling, but folk music particularly. Is that right, Rebecca? What's, a lot of folk songs do have strong narratives, don't they? Yeah, I'd say so. I think um, there is one definition that folk music is, is for the people, by the people, that notion that um, we create the music or we pass down the music. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of stories involved. And I think, for me, 
folk music are the the stories and whether that be personal I think I've resonated with a lot of personal um, stories in folk music as well as the the more general um, political as well as historical a lot of historical facts and events and um, situations have been uh, told in folk song and keeps those stories alive. Mm. Sue, what is, what is folk yeah, music? Yeah, I agree. And uh, it's, it's actually, I would say it's music of ordinary people, mm. even though you'll sing about kings and queens, but it's often about their ordinariness that you sing. So their loves, their triumphs, their failures. And I think when Beck and I were talking about this originally, I think the idea of folk music can be played and sung anywhere without any of this stuff. No offence, Chris, it's lovely to have a microphone. <laughs> but um, when we all would have started playing and singing, um, you only need a voice box, really, and a finger to click, yep. and you can sing and, uh, and entertain people and entertain yourself. And it's very egalitarian, actually, mm. very democratic. I mean, I've sung jazz and classical music, and... I don't think there's any more egalitarian community than the folk community, really, in terms of welcoming new players, new singers, songwriters. What do you reckon, Beck? Yeah, and I think it's that it can sometimes be defined by what it's not. Mm. We've discussed that mm. about how it's it can draw from a lot of other elements and genres, mm. but um, but it's it's not country music necessarily. Even though mm. we may sing some country songs within folk, we have a very different it's that egalitarian thing mm. there's there's it's not a competitive thing mm. um we share the music and we share the experience mm. rather than competing and try to trying to get to the top mm. of, of anything so, so there's a line drawn somewhere but we're not quite sure where it is yeah. you know we know what it's not where if it yeah. j- jumps over the line we know it's not there but not quite sure why well and also you think of a song like dirty old town the pogues mm. you know uh i think that's a folk song Mm. Even though it's like a pop song. Oh, the Pogues, song. definitely folk you know, music, yeah. but, yes. but they kind of, they blurred the boundary a little bit. They did. It yeah. was written by Ewan McColl yeah, in the yeah. 1950s, so maybe. folk songs are not like necessarily like traditional songs. No, mm. and the Pogues did a version of Waltzing Matilda, didn't they? Yeah, they did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or the band played Waltzing Matilda, yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and, so there's a nod, I guess, isn't there, um, a lot of music mm. to, you know, rock. To, f- mm. to folk and punk, and we got and there's you know, Red Gum, I suppose, the Pogues, Joni Mitchell, mm. Dexys, Midnight Runners, Bob Dylan. You can think of just about any generation, mm. and there's and 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 many groups of bands, and you can look at some of the things they do, and there's always mm. some folk music in there. Mm. Turn, 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 the number yes. one, sort of across the boundaries. But I reckon the other thing, folk music is incredibly portable, yes. incredibly <laughs> portable, <laughs> for better or worse. <laughs> Well, I mean, you've got some big instruments yeah, here. I'm not sure thinking, how portable have, they are. <laughs> having just <laughs> travelled around New Zealand with a cello and two guitars and a bar, and it's, it's a little well, less... I thought you were going to bring your portable. juice harp. Oh, yeah. okay. So what were you doing in New Zealand? I, um, I was travelling with my husband and musical partner, Donald Mackay. We just had a little tour of um, four, four gigs in New Zealand and, and had a little holiday and, and met other folkies in New Zealand, which was great to, to see that they're doing it over there and have a very similar history to us. Well, I think we should make a bit of use of the, the instruments as much as we can tonight. I mean, we, you know, it's almost like a concert up here. Can you yeah. can you actually sing something uh, now? Play Did something. Do you want to start? Well, I, I mean, I will just sing a, a little bit of a song. Um, that is probably the first one of the first songs I ever sang at the folk centre. Um, and it's a song that everybody sings um, at some point. So I won't sing it all, I'll just sing a little verse. Mm, Am I in the right key? The water is wide, I cannot swim all, and neither have I wings to fly. Give me a boat that can carry two. And both shall roll, my love and I. So that song will tell you all about love if we were to continue it, but that's probably enough for now. <laughs> Great. That, that song has a particular background. It's Scottish, isn't it? Scottish. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm interested in this because a lot of songs like that, that send shivers up 
your spine. I suppose if you're from a certain culture that yeah. might have had a Scottish background, is there something hardwired? I is there a, I reckon a, there is. Uh, yeah. I'd hate to say, but a race memory of some sort, a, a memory at least in your genes. I think so. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think so too. And I think that's why this music does speak mm. to a lot of people is, is because of that shared history and, and tapping into that mm. history and but ancestry. I mean, I mean, the other thing, too, is that you will find a version of that Scottish song mm. in America, you know, mm. so, or you'll find an Irish version of the same song. So there's this kind of weird connection of those stories and there's just a slight twist and you'll find it across the yeah. Atlantic. So it is, is it confined to a culture? We have certain music from certain cultures that could all often be described as folk music, but what you sang then was a particular... I suppose Anglo-Saxon mm. uh, origin folk music, and and we seem to be all um, Anglo-Saxon origin people here. Um, is there is there um, is it cultural more? Well, but every culture yep. has their own folk song tradition. So you know, the uh, Borjak wrote a lot of music based on Hungarian folk songs. So um, I don't know. Mm, I guess for for what we're talking about here in Brisbane, I think we do tend to draw mm. a lot more from the Anglo-Celtic mm. traditions yes. in, in mm. our expression of, of folk music. But that's not to say that in other places they wouldn't sing, sing from other traditions No, because well. I think of the bush bands that I went to see and it was a lot of Irish, Scottish music, yeah. wasn't yeah, it? So yeah, that's yeah. the tradition mm. there, at least in that culture, yeah. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit, because there is a big project underway, the um, Brisbane Folk History Project. It's a big one. And can you tell me a little bit about that? Um, what is that at the moment? Because that's what's happening now, isn't it, Rebecca? Yeah, An so attempt really, I think, to, uh, to gather as much information as possible about the Brisbane scene. Yeah. So uh, as I understand it, in, in around 2007, a couple of people, Alison McKenzie, who's here, and, and uh, Michael Tully started talking about um, this desire to, to collate and collect and document the the rich history that we have here in Brisbane um, of the folk history and I think the the first idea was to put together a, a visual documentary um, but unfortunately funding and and things like that has prevented that but instead um, there's been a lot of a recording of, of oral histories and a collection of the material that you see on the tables here and a lot of those stories are being put into a book which is being written um, by or put together by Andrea Baldwin who is, who is here tonight as well. So there's this um, book project that's happening and um, we're looking to have that out next year hopefully should be the draft should be ready by the end of the year and how much material publish. is there i imagine there was a lot a lot to look through i think there's hours and hours <laughs> and hours so there's been a big digitization program as well happening i know my dad's in the audience here as well chris wright he's been um busy uh documenting or putting the old vhs tapes onto digital format so that it can be archived um here it and passed on to the john oxley library so there'll be all of that accessible people in the future. Because in any one year there'd be a, a number of folk bands in, in Brisbane, wouldn't there? And you'd, you'd have them changing over and mixing and evolving and then disappearing. And Definitely. But, but over a period of, what, 50 years, mm. that's mm. a lot of bands. Yes. Can yeah. you, do you know them all? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't even try. I imagine if you, if you asked people around this room, the room they, they would collectively. With, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I suppose the significant band, well, for me anyway, is the Wayfarers because yes. that band has been, it doesn't exist anymore, um, really, I don't think, but it was in existence, you know, how old am I? 40 years ago when I was at the Folk Centre and, and it had already been going then. And just about every musician in every genre in Brisbane went through the Wayfarers. It's weird. Mm. But very portable, as you said, folk music, and so the Wayfarers could easily just get together tomorrow on a street corner. Well, some of them could, <laughs> but... <it's laughs> <laughs> the passage of time. The ones who are alive could. <laughs> Yeah, good sad, point. Sad it is. <laughs> so the State Library here has records going back to the 1950s. Yep. So, and I, need, I don't think either of you go back that far. <laughs> but uh, so, what do you remember, Sue, about the early days in, of your folk music? Oh, career? look, uh, my, my strongest memories are of the folk centre, and I was sort of 19, 18, 19, and I was quite shy. People who know me might find that hard to believe, but um, 
And it was really the folk centre that got me to sing because I was at Teachers College and someone told me about this place down an alleyway. Anyone here go to the folk centre in those days? No, so where is the folk centre? Well, it was <laughs> down an alleyway beside the People's Palace. Is that what it, People's Palace in Ann Street? Well, that sounds exactly where a folk centre should oh, be. And <laughs> I mean, I was so naive, and I really thought there was drugs in the coffee in the sugar bowls because I, I, <laughs> I was such a naive person. But I sang there, and I was able to sing because the whole place was in darkness. So when you were on the stage, you didn't kind of see people. And Stan Arthur, who kind of ran the folk centre, was incredibly welcoming. In fact, everybody was. So to get up and sing there um, was a joy. And I ended up in the Wayfarers. I think Sue Edmonds and I were the first females ever to be accepted into the Wayfarers, which was incredible. Um, and so, yeah, I've got very strong memories. And, and just people turning up at the folk centre who you'd never seen before walking on stage, doing an awesome set and then walking off into the night and never to be seen again. <laughs> and um, I guess one of the memories I have that I think is very funny, because there are a lot of cliches in folk music, you know, the hand over the ear, the harmonica on the, on the you know, dental thing that people <laughs> use that I have that my daughter won't let me use because I look <laughs> stupid. Um, but a fellow got on the stage one time with his harp in his little um, holder thing and he, he didn't have a harmonica in it, he had a toasted ham sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> so he sang and played and then he ate the sandwich. <laughs> it was very good. But I mean, there were people at the Folk Centre who specialised. Keith Smith sang long, terribly long, <laughs> turgid, <laughs> you know, horrible ballads that went on and on and on. And <laughs> Ken Evans sang uh, Australian songs about, you know, the bush and so on. And. Uh, so it was, it was an incredibly interesting and vibrant uh, scene, the Folk Centre. And there were other centres as well in Brisbane? Oh, not that I knew of. Yeah, no? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was the Barley Mo and the 291 Club. You should go and talk to Chris afterwards if you're interested because that was quite political, wasn't it, Chris? So the Communist Party was... Yeah, yeah, uh, there was a lot of there. politics around. And, uh, um, well, I don't know, what, what were the other... Barley Mo? They were the main ones yeah. of that particular point in time mm. as I understand it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Young thing. Yeah. So I, I'm of course the yeah, more oh, second the generation. Red Brick Hotel yeah, was the other one. Red Brick Hotel, which sort of came towards the end. Folk Centre finished in the late seventies, I think. Right. Yeah. So the, but the Communist Party I mean we had this association, mm. really a heavily association with between politics and folk music, don't yes, we? There was the Communist much. Party, you know, active in the in the folk centre. You know? Was the part was the oh, well? I mean, I, I felt that the whole thing was a nefarious, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I wasn't aware because I was completely oblivious to most things going on around me. Um, <laughs> but, but yes, there certainly was a political element, and Stan was very much. Uh, I think he he was in charge of a union or something. So it was it was quite. Um, yeah, there was a lot of politics around. Because folk music essentially is, I, I hate to say the word, peasant music, isn't it? I mean, it, it, we're all peasants at one stage. So, but, but it's 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 a very um, it's the music of the poor who, yeah. who don't have necessarily the the instruments of the rich. Mm. Yeah, that's um, right. And I mean, there's been a big change, I think, because we're more affluent. I yes. mean, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, there were things to protest about. You know, nuclear armaments and poor poverty and Immigrants. Oh, well, we've still got those things <laughs> all to that, protest yeah. about today, but we're incredibly comfortable. And, and, so and the portability of folk music mm. means you could take it along to a protest. Yeah, which happened yeah. a lot. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. is it still the realm? You said things have changed, but is it still largely the realm of the you know, the working class? I suppose the the, the left. I think there's still definitely that element. Yeah, there is. Yeah, yeah. there is still that um, element of of protest music, but not to the same extent. No as there was right, in Right, so the politics has sort of gone from it, do you think? There's still some big, very strong I messages. I don't think it's no. gone. I don't but think it's when gone, When you think yeah. about Noel Gardner, who sings a lot of political songs, it's just that we're all wearing a better quality shoe now. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, uh, but in those days... Well, we need a good depression no to get money, kick folk know. music along a bit, yeah. don't we? Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's yeah well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> good revolution. <Yeah. laughs> so, so times of social inequality. Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Mm. Mm. Rebecca, what drew you to folk music? How did you first get into it? Well, as I as I mentioned, my um my well has been mentioned. My mum and dad were involved in the folk scene back in the late se I mean early seventies, late sixties, early seventies, and um so I like my very early years, I heard about this 
folk scene and, and the festivals that happened in the early 70s. And, um, but my mum and dad were busy raising four kids at that stage. So it wasn't, on, it wasn't until um, the 1989 Mullaney, the National Folk Festival in Mullaney, that mum and dad went back to folk music and then took the kids the following year. And um, we went up just for a day but um, we loved it so much that every year since then we've gone as a family or, or part of the family. I think I've been to about, I don't know, 18 or 19 um, Mullaney and Woodford folk festivals. So it certainly was a rite of passage for me growing up, going to that festival every year and um, being exposed to, to such amazing music mm. as well as ideas and um, different ways of looking at the world. So I was certainly influenced by the, the songwriters that I saw there. Um, particularly uh, Judy Small was a huge influence on me. Judy was a very active singer in the 1980s and 90s. I could see people nodding there um, who spoke um, or sang about, about issues. A lot of her songs were about issues, be that um, feminism and, and uh, politics of the day and well, the Equality. 80s and 90s, the 70s, the big issues, weren't they? Mm, the big political mm. issues then to sing about. Yeah. So it was great to have a role model like her to, to, to not only um, sing about those things, but also personally I think I, I gained a lot of confidence in my mm. ability as a, a, as a woman in the world, I think, to be able to get up and, and I started singing her songs and it was through her songs that I found my own voice and my own, my own songs. Yeah. And you mentioned Woodford. We're very lucky in Brisbane, aren't we? Because we have, you know, down um, in northern New South Wales, um, festivals up at Mullaney mm. Folk mm. Festivals, mm. and there are quite a few festivals. Mm. Uh, there's one last weekend, I yep. yeah. understand. Maybe so we'll just come back here. Yeah, yeah. So th th um, they seem to be even more popular mm. now. What yeah, there's, there's a lot of music yeah. festivals around. Mm. So is there much of a change since the 80s and 90s to what, what is done now? Or is it similar? I think some of the, the big ones have gotten bigger, so certainly mm. Woodford's just grown and grown and grown. Um, but then from that, these smaller festivals have come up for the people who, who want a more intimate experience and maybe perhaps a more participatory experience mm. as well. Mm. So and somewhere where you can, right. um, say with the sake of um, Newham Creek that's just happened on the weekend. There's just one stage that mm. has a program of music, but then there's lots of opportunities to sing sing songs with other people um, when there's not music happening on stage, or even while there is music <laughs> happening on stage, you can go back to camp and have a sing, and then come back and see a band or mm. play. So yeah. it sounds like a, a, a community event though too. A lot of people would know each other at those festivals. Now they've been going to festivals for such a long mm, time definitely. there'd be a clique of people that would know, you know i don't know several hundred perhaps yeah. thousands yeah yep. the people yep. who yep. just go to the same festival mm. and, and so you get to know each other it's a wonderful it is it's thing it's to just do. such a great feeling to be at those smaller festivals and I, I i have to just if i may just say you know you mentioned judy small mm. and i remember going to see judy small in west end and i just i was it was a great concert and um i hope you don't mind me asking this ian but you know, so you know a Judy <laughs> Small song. You could sing it. it I was going to sing a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I think you should. Because it, it ties into the, the politics mm. of um, what we were just talking about, politics and folk music. So this is one of the, um, one of the first Judy Small songs that I, that I started playing back in, the, back in the 90s. And I think it's, it's still got a lot of relevance today as well. This is called um, You Don't Speak For Me. And if you know it, you can sing along. <laughs> You who scribble on walls with your minuscule minds You make midnight calls, you who rattle my blinds The violence you preach is the core of your creed Well, you don't speak for me You call yourselves patriots, swastika style You feed on the fear of the ignorant child but there's no love of nation or people or land in the hatred behind your smile you don't speak for me no you don't speak for me 
I've seen where you come from, I've seen where you lead. It's a poisonous fruit that grows from your seed. You stir up the hatred till something explodes. Well, you don't speak for me. You who, you who slaughter Cree creatures and then call it sport. You proudly display the corpses you've shot. And you talk about freedom and rights and control. Well, you don't speak for me. You who poison the airwaves with your Genghis Khan views. You broadcast your bias and you call it the news. And you say that you speak for the millions out there. And deny that you're lighting a dangerous fuse. Well, you don't speak for me. No, you don't speak for me. You don't speak for me, you don't speak for my friends. We've followed that line, we've seen where it ends. Intolerance, hatred, division and strife. Well, you don't speak for me. You who march in your hundreds of thousands for peace. You who work for political prisoners release. You who fight for the rights of all people in chains, you speak for me. You who combat apartheid wherever it's seen. You who struggle to keep the unique forest green. You who fight the injustice of women ignored, you speak for me. You speak for me. Yeah, you speak for me. When was that written, Rebecca? Uh, I think the early to mid 80s. Wow. Yeah. But I think it, it really encapsulates a lot of um, mm. what folk music is about as well. Yeah. That's yeah. a form of political commentary itself. It's quite powerful, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I remember the Franklin River Dam protests in yeah. Tasmania. Mm. And music certainly played a part of that campaign. Yeah. Yeah. We had last night's coup in Canberra. <laughs> <laughs> In the, in, the uh, in the olden days, my kids would say the olden days. Yeah. There'd be a there'd be a, a ballad or something to mock that that event. I'm sure. I think even some now somebody written. will be writing one. Absolutely. I'm sure. Oh, I should have penned one quickly last night. It would have been great. We could have broadcast it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, so I get the sense that folk music does change a bit, though, and so and, and it reflects social issues. Although it's not, you know, you're, what you're saying there, those social issues haven't really changed, no, have they? No, no, no. But 40, I think that years. there has been a change. We were talking about this when we were preparing this. A couple of things have changed. One of the things that I noticed is when I was singing at the Folk Centre, people would get up and sing bawdy songs. I mean, really quite dirty songs. <laughs> and I actually did bring the words of one, if if people don't mind. Oh, no, it's that's great. Right. People rude. love bawdy songs. <laughs> I have this little book called Marrow Bones, and it's full of traditional songs, um, and they're not all sort of grubby, <laughs> but some of them are. And there's there's one um, one here that I particularly like the name of, and it's called uh, the Furs Field. F U R Z E. It's not really about a furs field. I won't read that one, but the, <laughs> the lyrics. <laughs> the lyrics that I thought you might like. Yeah, this is a song called The Trooper's Horse. And I love the fact that in this book they always say it's from the singing of Mrs. Johnson or <laughs> this one's from the singing of Mrs. Goodyear. <laughs> and so it's basically about an old woman who lives under the hill and it's got a chorus by Rowdy Dowdy Doe and my Rowdy Dowdy Day, which is a typical folk thing. So the woman lives under the hill and a jolly dragoon, they're always jolly, the dragoons, <laughs> came riding by, you'll see why he's jolly in a minute, and he drank some, you know, he had a port and he had a few drinks. And, um, and then they both, he, there was a gorgeous daughter, as there always is, and they both went to bed with the mother's consent. So in those days, people were pretty broad-minded, I think. Da which days are they? <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> so I will just read you the verses as we go through. And I do apologise, there's a content warning here. Oh, that <laughs> one's too young to know. Um, and so this is the conversation in bed. 
She says, oh, what is this here? So stiff and so warm. Tis only my nag. It'll do you no harm. He says, but what is this? Tis a little well where your fine nag may drink his fill. Are you embarrassed yet, Ian? <laughs> <laughs> but I what if understand. my bonny nag should chance to fall in? He must hang on the grass that grows round the brim. <laughs> but what if the grass should prove to be rotten? He must bob up and down till he comes to the bottom. Wow. <laughs> wow, so... I'm sorry, it, but, you know... so the tradition. Yeah. <laughs> But I think that we're a little bit more squeamish these days. And I, I don't hear those sort of um, smutty songs. More's the pity. No, you don't hear it, do no. you? Oh, interesting. Are you going to bring back the boardy suit? I think so. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think there's a, a, a niche really market, I'm sure there they're is. They're always something. talking about, you know, there was one we used to sing in the, in the wafer as something about a, 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 some guy, a Scotsman, he had a kilt and a bumblebee stung him way above the knee. Yeah. <laughs> Up among the heather on the hill of Benahy. <laughs> <laughs> so the music's designed to be played with a lot of very basic instruments. And I remember spoons and bones and tea chests. And but the technology's uh, changed a lot and especially uh, it's accelerating now. There must mm. be opportunities there for folk music. Has, has it had much influence, the new technology? Uh, yes and no. I think... The fact that we we do primarily still use acoustic music, I mean acoustic instruments and ourselves as the instrument, I think that's mm. still the core of folk music is yep. that ability to just sing or play an instrument, to not have any electricity, that you don't need any technology for that. Um, but certainly we use technology, you know, I was using my iPad to tune my cello and, and things like that. So there, there are things that you can utilise and I think the role the biggest role that technology in the digital era has played in folk music is the accessibility to mm. um, to the songs and, and the stories <coughs> uh, of the tradition. Um, my husband Donald is an avid collector of, of folk music books from um, from the 1700s and, and beforehand. So he's got physical books, but also that now being able to access online these incredible libraries of, of folk mm. music songs and tunes to be able to get in there and, and, and see, then follow the lineage and the history of those songs and see where they've travelled. That's they've right, it must have opened it up in like many ways, in, in, a, in a way that it's never been able to mm. be opened up before. Yeah, yeah. and also because it's sharing, there's yes. mud cats, you know, where people share yeah, there's lyrics and that all sort sorts of, of forums mm. that you can be a part of. I remember speaking to John Thompson when, when <laughs> he was um, up here having a, a chat, oh, it might have been last year, but he was doing some, I'm pretty sure it was John, he was looking at some old songs that he'd found in old newspapers. So mm. if you go to Trove, you can look up yep. um, old music, uh, old songs. Mm. But the music wasn't there with them. But he was trying to uh, reverse engineer yep. the lyrics yep. to f see what what the what melody, what the melody, mm. Mm. What melody yeah. might have fitted, mm. and he found a few. I think mm. that's astonishing. Yeah. Mm. It's a yeah. Yeah. interesting way of using the technology, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and even you know YouTube, you can disappear down that rabbit hole. <laughs> And I discovered a woman, a woman called Judy Sill, through my daughter actually, I think, who was around at the time of Carol, um, Joni Mitchell. She mm. lived in the canyon and all of that. And she died, at, I think, at 30 or something. And there's a few um, grabs of her on YouTube and she is astonishingly good. Mm. She's just a superb songwriter and singer, you know. So, so, so yeah, it's wonderful it's to be able to yeah. use YouTube in that way as well really and to good. learn new music. Yeah, and, and yeah. Sing, yeah. So who generally sings folk music? What, uh, what sort of? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, it's co-opted by interest groups, isn't it? When so when something needs to be said, you, so daggy, you, you have daggy you people. protests, <laughs> unions, and for yourself, Sue. <laughs> Well, rabble rousers, isn't it really? So you've got it's the protest not the movements. It's the coolest form of music. Oh, to be no, honest. no, to be honest, it's, it's definitely not. No, it's not, is it? No, it's very powerful. It's it does have a, it, it, it mightn't be cool, but it, it can certainly touch a nerve when it needs to. Oh, it's incredibly definitely. powerful. I think it's great that it's not cool. Yeah, it's really? probably what attracts us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So to it. So voice for the oppressed? <laughs> <laughs> you can be yourself in folk music. Yeah. I think that's mm. that's one of the the beautiful things about it is that it is a very authentic mm. form of music, and and you know you can dress as yourself and and 
you don't what have do to. Do? Well, you have to dress it. Just you wouldn't want to come along with a suit on, would you? That, would be, <laughs> that wouldn't be folk. Well, you know there is the the, the suited bluegrass yes. set. We've been that crossover into folk. Oh, there right. is definitely you know oh, there's there a, a, an amazing band called The Company. <gasps> Um, based here in Brisbane, and they they do wear the the shirt and tie and look very oh, okay. very smart. <laughs> so so we're not all daggy. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Of course not. <laughs> so you both write songs we as do. well as perform. What influences yeah. the writing of a folk song for you, sir? Oh, look, I don't know. I mean, I think you get immersed in that in that tradition of telling stories, and then. You know, something... I mean, I, I've, I've written songs for films and, um, in fact, my band is called Unsung Heroes and I wrote a song for a movie that was about women and work. And the, the story about that is that um, we wanted to get... Um, oh, Don't Be Too Polite, Girls. Who wrote that song? A really... Cr- a very well-known yes. Australian woman <laughs> wrote Don't Be Too Polite, Girls and that was the song we wanted for the movie. And so the producer rang this woman whose name escapes me and she was offended for some reason. She said, I'm not using my song. Yeah. And I, in a moment of weakness, said to the producer, I'll write a song. And then I thought, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> so I did. I wrote a song. But, um, yeah, and I mean, I've, a song that I wrote, uh, that I sang at the Folk Centre was about the Vox Flat mining disaster, um, which I could sing a little yeah, bit. Absolutely. Be- before you do, before you pick up your guitar, can I? Uh, is there a narrative structure then to writing a song? I mean, there is. I mean, I write. I write books, and I'm, mm. I'm conscious now of, I suppose, the uh, the tricks, not tricks, but the mm. the way it has to be structured to keep people listening or reading. Oh, I think there is. I mean, for especially for folk chorus. music. The yeah, gen- generally in folk music you would have a chorus, but the the song that I I sang just then didn't, didn't have a chorus. Have that, so. Yeah. Um, but it had some very powerful points, and yes. they kept coming at you. So yeah. you think, "Oh, that's interesting." There is an often repeti- yes. a repetitive, yeah, yeah. yeah some element. kind of yeah. pattern. So the box flat. I will sing it. Uh, uh, sadly, I have to just have a little cheat sheet, which is a bit embarrassing. Um, I, I wrote this song and sang it not long after this thing happened, and it was. Ju- I just sang it one night at the folk. <coughs> Centre, and there was somebody there from the media, <coughs> and he, I was 19, and he said, could we use your song when we document what happened? And naively, I said, yes, I should never have done it, but I didn't know. Why? So they, well, they played my song, they recorded it, and they played it over slow-mo footage of the box flat mine, and it was mawkish, and it was awful, and it was sort of... It was wrong. It was inappropriate. And so people rang the radio stations abusing me, (laughs) 19, for writing this song and and making money or something. And it was awful. And I... Does anyone remember Wilson Irving? Well, he was chiefly the one who was getting stuck into me. And so one day, after this had gone on for a couple of days, I basically rang the radio station in tears and said, look, that's not what happened. And so, But it was awful. I didn't sing it then for 20 years. But I do sing it now. The day it was Monday, quite late in July, when 17 miners at Box Flat did die. These gallant coal miners lie buried below. In shaft number seven, all covered in coal. The coal it went out. And the men, they arrived to put out the fire in shaft number five. Such brave-hearted colliers you never would find. For many's the danger way down in the mine. Give to the cause their children and wives. But no one can pay for those poor miners' lives. Fourteen stout miners worked fast underground, sought to put out the bright fire they'd found. Then at 2.45, two blasts shattered the mine. And all hope was lost 
when the clock it struck nine. Later that morning, the mine it was sealed, and only the smoke from the tunnel revealed that fourteen brave miners had met with their doom and lay buried down in a pitch black tomb. Give to their wives, their children and wives, but no one can pay for those poor miners' lives. Now it's many years later, and there's nothing to see. Maybe grass and a park where the mine used to be. But the wind in the water makes a sorrowful sound as it sings to the miners who sleep underground. Give to the cause their children and wives, but no one can pay for those poor miners' lives. I can't really see how anybody would be offended by that, and I can understand why the journalist would want to run that across the footage. It's it a powerful song. It was, it was too just too, too much. Soon. Too soon. Too yeah, soon, of too course. Soon. Yeah, no, that's it. There's a problem, yeah. yeah. Yep, yep. Um, Rebecca, you're, I mean, what, what influences you when you write? I guess I tend to write more about um, personal stories, experiences, is, is the way that my songs seem to manifest. And um, I don't set out to do that. It just seems to happen for me um, rather than, I think, writing um, songs more like, the one you've just sung, so is is can be more challenging to to be able to tell those stories in a, in an effective way. Um, so I guess if I want to sing a song like that, then I'll find something that expresses what I want to say. But generally, my songs tend to be a little bit more from the personal rather than the political. Mm. Do you have something? Yeah, I can. Sure. Excellent. Yeah. Sure. yeah. <coughs> it's a little song called "All I See." Which is appropriate considering mentions flying and I was at a, on a plane at some very early hour this morning. <laughs> Been away, now I'm coming home. To our flight seems far too slow Ignore the snores from the man beside I just keep looking out my window But it's hard to tell from up this high just what is ocean and what is sky and it's hard to say just how I feel when all I see is blue feel alive when I look at art the shapes and colors they can shift my heart I wanted to show you I wished you were there all my excitement I wanted to share but it's hard to tell from up this high just to what is ocean and what is sky and it's hard to say just 
how I feel when all I see is blue. sleep when it's time to land I gather my thoughts before I stand I walk the tarmac I'm soon inside it's been a strange and bumpy ride but it's hard to tell from down this low just to where I've come from and where I'll go and it's hard to say just how I feel when all I see is you So is that on an album that we can buy? It is, yes. <laughs> I even have some copies. <laughs> <laughs> Good on you. Clever thing you are. Beautiful song. Thank you. Um, so if people want to get involved in folk, in the folk scene in Brisbane, I guess, where where can they where can they go now? Well, right now they could head across to the Bug, the yeah. Brisbane Unplugged. Yeah. Um, Unplugged gigs. Brisbane gigs, that's it. Brisbane Unplugged gigs, which is happening at the the New Farm Bowls Club every Tuesday night. There's a wonderful mm. um, concert, I guess, happens at the Bowls Club where it's they. It's a bit expensive though, Beth. It's oh about yeah, eight bucks. Eight bucks. To get yeah, in or yeah, yeah. Or five dollars if you're concession. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so very reasonably priced, and generally they have two um, two booked acts every week mm. um, they can be international sometimes um, as well as local bands and every Tuesday night as well they have um, generally three what they call blackboard acts as well so there's three people come along or three groups just get up and, and do a, a couple of songs each before the, the main acts so that's one of the best things to go to. It's great. And you can get veal parmigiana, chicken parmigiana, cheap, really good. Yeah. Um, beer, but beer, yeah, bowls club prices for yeah. the beer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there's also the folk club um, on a Wednesday night at Red Hill Sports Club. Um, and that's a totally unplugged. I mean, the bug says it's unplugged, but, <laughs> but it's not. <laughs> there is amplification. But at the folk club, um, which is hosted by Anne on Font, who's folk royalty in Brisbane, um, and Anne is uh, quite averse to amplification of any kind. So um, it's just a, a room in the Red Hill Bowls Club where we get together every Wednesday night and sing and play and tell stories. I'm assuming you can go online. There would be a website that, should, that tells you where all the gigs are. There is. There's a wonderful website called The Folk Rag, so folkrag.org, or you can just Google The Folk Rag. And um, it used to be a paper pu publication, which was wonderful, and it ran for mm, many, many it? years. Mm. Um, and, uh, but now it's just gone online now. But um, Michael Bourne's still doing a wonderful job keeping all that running. It's a big job. <laughs> so that's where you can find all things folk here in Brisbane is uh, yeah. folkrag.org. And, and there's, if those of you who like to move your feet, there are bush dances at Morningside and uh, contra yeah. dances and all sorts of folky type dancing things that happen, but yeah. also in the folk rag. Yeah. yeah, all our details are there. You can also come and join the, the folk choir which mm. happens on a Thursday night, run by Nicole Murray. So we do a, a range of um, different folk songs, mainly from the Anglo-Celtic tradition. Um, so that's a great thing to be involved in. So anybody can come along and join that. You don't have to audition or anything, and you can 
yeah, it'd be lovely to have more voices in that. And there's also the Brisbane Celtic Fiddle Club, um, where you can come and learn Scottish and some Irish tunes, but mainly Scottish tunes. You don't have to just play fiddle to, I play the big fiddle in that group, um, but we do have other instruments as well come along to, to learn tunes, and that's um, twice a month on a, on a Friday night. But if you want any details, you can come and see me about that. And also, if you look on the Folk Rag website, there are more and more house concerts too. Mm. And that's a lovely thing to do. People give their homes and someone is coming to town and there'll be a house concert. And that's just a, a, a great way to listen to music, yeah. And there's also a, a great email list to get on to mm. as well, the Brisbane mm. Folk email list, which um, Shez Wright organises that one and she sends out everything that's happening as well. Mm. So now, if we will get uh, another a final song from you both. Yeah. Uh, I'm assuming the big fiddle's got a role to play in it that. It does, yes. <laughs> But are there, uh, we normally have more time for questions, but I suspect that, that I think you've just about covered everything. <laughs> I uh, think the one thing we ooh, haven't talked, and yes. I'm not going to say too much, but there's a lot of humour in folk songs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are funny songs all the time, so it's not all doom and gloom. Well, we've had a lot of laughs tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and I do tend to laugh in all the wrong places yeah. in some of the really sad well, songs. That's nice. Oh, there's a question. Great. I just want to say, too, that I think the audience is really important. Ah, yes. yes. <laughs> Try and stop them, I yeah. say. Mm. So I think the audience is a, a really significant um, dimension. Yes. It is. You're right, man. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. 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 And there's a lot of shyacking and back and forth. You know, no one it's takes fine. themselves too seriously. Mm. That's good. Mm. Any other questions? Or statements Any questions? like that? <laughs> a st- or a statement? Or yeah, just an observation. Red Hill, two dollars <laughs> at Red Hill. <laughs> Oh, that's, that's closer right. to where I live as well, so yeah. that might be the case. And we game. provide supper, so, so everyone oh, has a turn, fantastic. and so you get amazing <laughs> suppers, yeah. That's what you need to see in regarding the, the body songs, is the fact that... Uh, can you speak in a way that we can understand? <laughs> 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 yes. When are you going to do a Robert Burns Audi <laughs> concert? Yeah, no, there's an opening for I that. <laughs> you Red can Hill, do it behind $2. a screen. <laughs> <laughs> that would remind me of Newham Creek too much. <laughs> Sounds like an in joke. Well, how about we have a final, a final um, song, and then after the song, um, uh, you, we'll, we get to ask more questions personally. Sure. Yeah. Come and come and have a chat. Yeah. And certainly, this final one is is definitely one that you you will recognise. So, in the in the folk tradition, as was mentioned there, feel free to join in because it's it's made to for singing. <laughs> Are you okay to do a little start of it, or would you like to start? Just start. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the summer time is coming. And the trees are sweetly blooming And the wild mountain thyme Grows around the blooming heather Will ye go, lassie, go And we'll
If my true love, he were gone, I would surely find another to pull wild mountain time all around the blooming heather. Best, that's probably the best note to leave it on, really, <laughs> isn't it? Nice. Thank you, um, Sue White and, and Rebecca Wright. Thank you.